The United States Constitution holds the separation of church and state as sacrosanct. It's a pillar of American democracy and a core facet of its identity. However, in recent years, there's been an undercurrent of religious rhetoric and symbology permeating political discourse. Christian nationalism is a term you might have heard on the news or in speeches from some on the right. But what is it really? And is it on the rise? This week in an Upfront special, we take a closer look at Christian nationalism and how it's affecting politics and civil rights in the United States. Joining us to discuss this is Anthea Butler, Chair of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania and author of White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. Amanda Tyler, Executive Director of the Baptist Joint Committee and contributing author to the Christian Nationalism and the January 6th Insurrection Report. And Kristen Dumay, Professor of History at Calvin University and author of Jesus and John Wayne. How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. Some provocative titles around here. <laughs> Anthea, thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to start with you first. Uh, the term Christian nationalism has cropped up at various times in U.S. history, uh, and some would argue it's a, had a consistent presence since the country's founding, uh, from connections to white supremacist groups uh, like the KKK uh, to the more recent Patriot Front. Uh, Christian nationalism is by no means a new phenomenon. Uh, taking its history into account, how do you define Christian nationalism as it is today? Actually, simply, I just define it as people who believe that God um, created America for a purpose, that America is special. In other words, when you are a Christian nationalist, you believe that God created America as a Christian nation, first of all. Second, that white men who were the founders of this nation were also Christian. And that third, that Christianity is the most important religion of all. And that really flies in the face of a lot of things that the founders and the French I mean, you'd have to said. almost ignore all the founding documents... Absolutely. ...to, to arrive at this position. It's Absolutely. a fascinating one. I, I've never understood it. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the things that I find troubling about this is the two things, actually. One is the way in which they get it all wrong about the founders and the framers and things that they've said and what our documents say in the Declaration of Independence, in the Constitution, you know, no religious test. They believe in religious tests, and, and there's a big religious test about Christianity. But at the same time, they don't want a lot of government but they want a Christian government. And so th these are the things that I, I call the tensions within Christian nationalism, about Christian nationalists who can't really get the story right 100%. Yeah. And, you know, for all of us around this table, we might have different iterations of what we think Christian nationalism is, but I do think it lodges in very much in the history of this nation, how it was founded and why it was founded, and everyone trying to put a divine sort of approbation about America on top of everything. Christian... Christian nationalism has had, like, a revival, really a strong one since the 1970s, uh, when evangelicals on the right kind of aligned themselves with the Republican Party, uh, presumably in an effort to kind of galvanize uh, an anti-liberal movement. Yeah. Uh, take us through what's happened over the last... Oh, my God, it's been 50 years. I didn't realize the 70s was 50 years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> take me through the last half yeah. century of what's happened yeah. and how the ideology has kind of evolved over time. No, you're exactly right. So the idea that America is a Christian nation has been around for a very long time. But what we're talking about today, the current kind of explosion of conversation around white Christian nationalism really can be traced back to the 1960s and 1970s, emerging in this Cold War era. Now, just before that, you had a strong sense of patriotism, right? We had a common enemy in communism, and Christian nationalism was often something that united Americans together. Not just the, not just right-wing politics. Exactly. A kind of consensus era. In the 60s, that starts to splinter. And we have the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, and the anti-war movement. And that's when we see some of these core values of patriotism, of Christian America, of gender traditionalism, kind of come together in an oppositional movement so that we have people who are holding to these values are doing so over against other Americans. Mm. over against civil rights activists, over against feminists, liberals, anti-war activists, right? And so it becomes this kind of oppositional movement, and it allies with the modern Republican Party. And that's really this Christian nationalism that we are seeing today, but it has been brewing for a very long time. In white evangelical spaces, 
Right. Anthea talked about kind of this um, mythical notion, right? This is an inaccurate understanding of our nation's past. It ignores a lot of our founding documents. They will talk about the myth of the separation of church and state, but this has been cultivated in these spaces for decades, in sermons, in popular literature, in Christian film, and so it is really pervasive, and we're really seeing the, the fruits of those seeds uh, very clearly today. Hmm. Uh, Amanda, Christian nationalism and evangelicalism are often sort of conflated, particularly in the context of Trump in the era of Trump, where kind of the followers are kind of all in the same mix. Uh, but many argue that these groups are actually not the same, that they're distinct. Uh, what specifically distinguishes Christian nationalists from evangelicals? Well, I think it's important to note that Christian nationalism, Christian nationalism as an ideology is a problem for all of the country and is a problem for all iterations of Christianity. So while it would be convenient to say this is totally aligns with this one expression of Christianity, I don't think that's accurate. I think that uh, Christians from across, from all the different denominations, need to wrestle with Christianity. Christian nationalism and understand how that's different than Christianity. I think that Christian nationalism, though, can help explain why evangelicals as a voting bloc, white evangelicals voted in such high numbers for Trump. What, but what makes an evangelical an evangelical? Well, that's a that's a million dollar question. Um, but I think that it's become a term that's more about identity than about religion, especially for white evangelicals. And that's because they're voting in such lockstep for a figure like Trump and then mm. now for Trump acolytes who are running in this in this election. So it is more about an identity that carries with it assumptions about nativism and authoritarianism and patriarchy than it does about a religion of Christianity. So it's not a particular faith claim or a particular orientation, a particular theological disposition or... I think it's both. Okay. I think it's both, but I think increasingly we hear it as more of a political movement than a religious identity, and that's concerning from from the. Do y'all agree with that? Well, I would say it this way, um, and I'm interested to hear what Kristen would say too. I would say that it used to be a theological construct that lay in kind of ideas that came out of the 17th and 18th century. What, what does it mean to be evangelical? You know, when we think of the word evangelical, which is basically spread the gospel and the good news, right? This is how evangelicals always thought of themselves. What we see now is evangelicalism being equated with politics. And so I've said before, I wrote an article back in 2012 about this, and I said that republicanism was a new religion and that this was a religion that had aligned itself with with evangelicalism, and I think right. one Y'all gotta explain yeah. something to me then. Yeah. Yeah. This I, becomes this helps, both fascinating and confusing yeah. to me. If we say it's a political identity, yeah. and we say it's rooted in a particular set of Christian values around uh -huh. spreading the good news, right? Yeah. I get that there are competing interpretations and ideas right. about what it means to be Christian, about what the mm -hmm. good news is, about the New Testament, about Jesus. I get all of that. Right. But I can't imagine any iteration mm -hmm. that makes sense and co corresponds to Trump. And yet evangelicals tied themselves to Trump. If you're an evangelical of any sort, whether you're, uh, if, even if you thought of it as, thought of it as a left-wing mm -hmm. ideology, if you thought of it as a right-wing ideology, mm -hmm. if you were a quote-unquote Bible thumper, mm -hmm. if you were, you, you know what I mean? If you mm -hmm. were a literalist, mm -hmm. if you, I mean, there's no version of this thing that makes sense uh, with Trump's <laughs> presidency, his identity, his character, his history, his state. Yeah. Why do these people pick Trump? Somebody please help me understand that. I'd love to take please. that one. Please, go. So, um, <laughs> you're right. Uh, some evangelicals will define themselves as a theological, as a group defined by their theology. Mm -hmm. And they'll talk about things like a born-again experience and the authority of the scriptures and um, uh, the centrality of the cross of Christ, right? This is how they will define themselves, at least their leaders will. As a cultural historian, when I was looking at the history, I saw that didn't really hold together. It doesn't make sense because the vast majority of black Protestants in this country, for example, could check off all of those boxes. Yeah. And they do not identify as evangelical because it's very clear. And evangelicals don't identify them as them either, right? Uh, most do not, right? Some, not. some will claim them, but not actually, you know, they won't be in the same churches together or in the same organizations mm -hmm. in many cases. And so I see evangelicalism largely as a cultural movement and a system of networks and alliances. So if you want to understand 
evangelicalism today, you have to look at their organizations, at, their, at Christian publishing, at these massive industries. It's a consumer culture, Christian radio. And so it, it shares a quote unquote Christian worldview and far and wide through this popular culture and through membership in these organizations. And that membership is police, right? There are gatekeepers here. And it's those organizations that then unite with political organizations. Mm -hmm. Now, the story of how do we get from this understanding of evangelicalism to support of Donald Trump, that's where we have to bring in the politics and the power. Because within these communities, they have for half a century now cultivated this understanding that they are under threat that they have to fight to restore Christian America and that the liberals are against them, everybody is. So they need power. They need power in order to restore Christian America. And Trump came in and he was the right guy for the job precisely because he was not constrained by traditional Christian virtue. And he told them he would fight to protect Christianity and they actually called him their ultimate fighting champion. He was their warrior and he would be ruthless on their behalf to preserve their supremacy. Exactly, and, and supremacy is the right word here because there's one more thing to add. He was for white people, period. Hmm. And so this is the thing that I get at in my book is that I want people to understand that evangelicals have always had problems about race. Yeah, you say and racism is, is, a, is a feature, sure, not, and a not a bug. Not a bug. It's a feature of this. And, you know, there's a one kind of history that we talk about in evangelicalism that's great abolitionism, you know, trying to get the vote, uh, suffrage, all of these things, right? Even helping with the civil rights movement, right? But there's another history about evangelicalism separating because it's wanting to have slaves, Southern Baptists. KKK, who starts the KKK? A pastor, all right? You know, we have, who are we fighting against? King, because they are evil, because they are trying to usurp the status quo. Mm. We, we, you can see how this goes, right? So by the time you get to Trump, right? What have you just had before Trump? A black president, Barack Hussein Obama, who can't possibly be from America. Who is, you know, a usurper? Who is why the Tea Party movement happened? And then you get Donald Trump. And all of these people who are evangelicals in 2016, you have a rise in people who vote for Donald Trump in 2020. But what studies have found, one in particular, I'm sorry I'm forgetting the name, that they said more people called themselves evangelical because of what happened in 2016. It's mm. not because they thought they believed in this particular kind of Christianity. It's because they believed that evangelicalism meant white to them. And that is the core of all of this. The whiteness is embedded in American evangelicalism. You can have black evangelicals, you can have Latino evangelicals, but white evangelicals are the sine qua non of everything. They are it. And so as a voting block, they are the people that they go for. And let me say this very clearly, because this is the way you need to understand why evangelicals like Donald Trump. Donald Trump delivered. Donald Trump delivered Supreme Court justices, over 200 justices. Donald Trump delivered for them. He was their deliverer and provided Now, when we say delivered Supreme Court justices, we're yeah. talking about... Yes. Uh, justices who would overturn Roe v. Wade. That's right. Okay. And which was the thing that they have been fighting for for a very long time. And so he got those justices. He got those justices. For them. He lined up everything for them. So why wouldn't they go to the Capitol and fight for him? Why wouldn't they go to the ballot box and fight for him? Why wouldn't they believe that the election was a lie? Because Donald Trump was ordained by God to be in that particular position. And so that's what evangelicals think right now who are for Donald Trump. Uh, Chris, in your book, uh, Jesus and John Wayne, you write that evangelical support for former uh, President Donald Trump is the culmination of evangelicals' embrace of militant masculinity and the callous display of power at home and abroad. Those are ideas that seem, to, again, to be at odds with some of their fundamental faith claims, fundamental beliefs. Um, how... Do you reconcile? How do they reconcile these things? Do they attempt to reconcile? And I'd love you to weigh on this as well, Amanda. How, how do they reconcile this stuff? Yeah, I mean, they, they did seem to be. When I first uh, started this research, which was almost 20 years ago now, actually, I was, I was looking at popular evangelical books on masculinity and how to be a Christian man. And this is a huge market, right? These books, some of them are selling in the millions. Uh, so a vast market. And people are, men are studying these in churches and in small groups. What does it mean to be a Christian man? Well, I read some of these and I was surprised 
because there weren't a whole lot of Bible verses in these books. Instead, they, <laughs> <laughs> they looked to Hollywood heroes. They looked to Mel Gibson's William Wallace from the movie Braveheart. Right? That's their favorite. They looked to cowboys and warriors and soldiers and John Wayne, right? And this was not like Jesus. Not Jesus, right? But then what they ended up doing is they transformed Jesus. They transformed the Jesus of the Gospels into this warrior Christ. Now, you can find some passages in Revelation to work with and to build on. And then they, they make Jesus into this, like, man on it with big muscles, on um, tattoos down his leg, uh, charging into battle, wielding a bloody sword to slay his enemies. So when they're talking about following Christ, right, that's the Christ that they're holding up, not the Christ who says, love your enemies, love your neighbor, turn the other cheek and put that sword away. And so there's theological work actually being done to transform historic Christian teachings in the service of their own quest for power. Amanda, you said that Christian nationalism was a political ideology, not a religious identity, as you've talked about here. Uh, but Christian nationalism is distinguished from everyday political conservatism. Why has this kind of nationalist ideology been attached to Christianity in the U.S. in particular? There's always been this disconnect about who we say we are and who we really are. And so who we say we are as a country is a country that embraces religious freedom for all. Uh, it's right there in our founding documents, no religious test, and that there will, our government will remain secular so that religion can flourish. But Christian nationalism, which privileges Christianity and says there is a special place for Christians in American society, has been running alongside these ideals all the way. Mm. And so I think it's just been there for people to seize upon and try to organize around. And there is cultural le legitimacy still to being a Christian. There is a special place, it seems, in different, in elective office. Uh, all of our presidents, for instance, have all professed Christianity. Despite, Even Donald Trump. Exactly. Despite there being no religious test for public office. And so I, I think that we, we see this tension in our society right now. And so there's something still a culturally current about being a Christian and professing Christianity that provides cover for uh, what is really become authoritarian action mm. uh, in, in our current context. I, I want to drill down a little bit on this question about uh, the kind of foundational documents of the United States and how uh, they say there's no religious test and how they establish uh, separation of church and state and such. Uh, Anthea, Thomas Jefferson, yeah. Uh, refer to the Establishment Clause in the First Amendment mm -hmm. as a wall of separation between yes. religion and government, or yeah. as we commonly call it, again, the separation of church and state. But Christian nationalists seem to want to undermine this, which wouldn't be so weird if they weren't also brandishing the Constitution mm -hmm. and constitutional rhetoric about freedom and democracy and liberty. Yeah. How yeah. do they reconcile this? Maybe, I'm ask, maybe I shouldn't even be asking this. Well, I think probably the question isn't, you know, how are they doing it? The question is, they're doing it. And, and they don't really care about that history. Thomas Jefferson... But is this, is this disingenuous, though? I mean, it is disingenuous. It's absolutely disingenuous because, as many people know around this table, there's lots of um, tomes that have been written about history from a very strange perspective, i.e. David Barton, who writes these histories that are not real histories about America and American religion, right? And so when Thomas Jefferson is writing to the church in Danbury, Connecticut, and saying, you know, there should be this wall, there's no... Real, we're not doing this, right? Right? They don't care that Thomas Jefferson had a Quran. They don't care that that Quran is sitting right down the street in D.C. at the Smithsonian. What they care about is that God made this a special nation. And so when you talk about this nation being special, those documents, yeah, you can read them how you want to read them, because you don't read the same history that Kristen is teaching in her history class or I'm teaching in an American religion class. They're not reading that stuff. They are reading these kinds of made-up tomes. This is, this is a nostalgia movement. And we have to think about Christian nationalism as nostalgia. Nostalgia for a time that never existed. Nostalgia for a time that didn't exist at the beginning of this nation. Why did people come here? They came here to escape, you know, tyrannical religion in England. They wanted to have religious freedom to do what they wanted to do. They were religious people. And now we see this being used as, no, 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 we need to have a state religion, just like England. This is crazy, right? <laughs> because you're doing exactly the thing that our founders and framers were went to battle for. 
And so I think what we have to really understand about people who are embracing Christian nationalism right now is that they may not get all the nuances around this table, right? They just hear this as another phrase in a whole line of phrases like make America great again, American exceptionalism, the greatness of America that have been spewed out from different kinds of people throughout our history. Kristen, uh, some would argue that Christian nationalism is gaining political clout. Uh, a number of politicians like Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, Lauren Boebert, and Republican Pennsylvania gubernatorial candidate Doug Mastriano have all been increasingly in the spotlight while towing the Christian nationalism line. Uh, is Christian nationalism's influence on the rise, or is it a matter of these voices being louder and taking up more space in the political discourse? It's both. It's both. And that's been something that we've seen really just in the last few months. Uh, initially, when scholars, uh, social scientists, and so were surfacing this and, and saying this is Christian nationalism and, and it's authoritarian and anti-democratic and it's all of these other things, uh, we saw inside Christian spaces among those who were promoting Christian nationalism deny that it even existed uh, and say that, that you're just smearing us for being patriots. Mm -hmm. and, and then within just weeks, we saw the rhetoric shift, and we saw people like Marjorie Taylor Greene come out and say, yes, I'm a Christian nationalist, uh, nationalist Lauren Boeber, and proud of it. And, and not just that, but all Christians ought to be Christian nationalists, and then all Christians are Christian nationalists. Amanda, we have seen the overturning of Roe v. Wade, a landmark federal ruling that guaranteed the right to abortion, uh, a wave of anti-trans legislation, government funding earmarked for religious education, all of it's kind of part of an alarming shift in policy and uh, judiciary rulings tied to the far right. Going forward, how is Christian nationalism going to affect uh, the fundamental, I mean, really the, the basis uh, of civil rights for people in the United States? Yeah, I think Christian nationalism strikes at the very heart of civil rights for all Americans. I have said that Christian nationalism is the single biggest threat today for religious freedom for all because it cuts at, against that core foundational idea that our belonging in American society should never depend on how we worship or how we identify religiously. And Christian nationalism tries to blow all of that up. And so one part of Christian nationalism, of course, is this idea that the United States should be declared a Christian nation. Uh, it, very alarmingly, there was a new poll out that a majority of Republicans uh, believe that the United States should be declared a Christian nation even though a majority of Republicans also know that that's unconstitutional. Yeah. Um, so, so they understand. That's why I don't believe that, that uh, Christ, those who most espouse Christian nationalism really believe in the First Amendment. They don't. They believe in a, a system of government that would privilege Christianity. And unfortunately... It's so fascinating given how melodramatically they have talked about... Yes going into the Middle East, how they need to tear down Islamic government, Islamic states, how they've denounced Islamic nationalism and religious tests of other sorts. Uh, and they're really saying, we don't have a problem with states and religion. We just want our state and our religion. I, th I think you got it. I think that's exactly right. That the uh, hypocrisy of, of condemning religious nationalism on the world stage while trying to embrace it at home. But that's exactly what's happening. And I think in a post-Row world, we will see attempts at religious laws being passed in the state legislatures. And at the same time, the U.S. Supreme Court in the last term, not only with the Dobbs decision, but also with really landmark uh, decisions uh, trying to destroy the wall between, of separation between church and state, have undercut the legal protections and that that could become a reality. I think this is incredibly concerning, uh, both for civil rights of all Americans and especially for those in our public schools. I, I'm really concerned about Christian nationalism and civil rights of our youngest neighbors, those in the public schools, and, and for instance, if we might see more state-sponsored religious exercise in the public schools, mm. as well as, of course, the attack on history being taught in the public schools. They would much rather teach the mythology of a Christian nation than a candid history of the United States. We could, we could literally end up with schools where dinosaurs are out of the curriculum and, and we're going back to creation, creation stories. Well, I mean, I can't believe we're having this conversation, but we no longer have the legal protections or the support of the, of the 
United States Supreme Court in helping us mm -hmm. fend off attacks like this. And so it's going to be up to those of us who, uh, who are concerned about Christian nationalism, who don't want to see this as a religious state, uh, who care about religious freedom for all people to stand up and hew to those foundational ideals. Well, I want to thank the three of you for an amazing conversation. Thank, Thank you, you so much. All right, that is our show. Upfront, we'll be back next week.